Hello, word nerds. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. My name is still Spencer. Glad to have you here. Hope that you are sharing this, subscribing to it, telling all the people that you know about this podcast where we learn some things. We learn some very important things and we just, we have so much fun along the way. We're making friends with these words. Oh yeah, there's going to be some some words that maybe a lot of us are not familiar with in this episode, especially me. So the first one, the first word is ectoparasite. Ectoparasite. E C T O P A R A S I T E. Reminder that the ecto, the ecto prefix means uh, basically outside or external. So I'm going to guess that this is some kind of parasite that is living on the outside of, of its uh, host. It is a noun from 1861, a parasite that lives on the exterior of its host. I guess I would rather have a parasite live on the outside than the inside of me because that just freaks me out. The idea of some sort of living creature, one of those worms in your digestive system, something like that on the inside of me, just, I can't, I just can't deal. I can't deal, I can't deal with it. But if it's on the outside, I can just be like, what's up, dude? And then just yank it off. No, that's not how you're supposed to do things. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of animals, though, that um that they just have these they have these things are they uh are they symbiotic relationships i don't know if you can call it a symbiotic relationship when the thing is called an ectoparasite ectoparasitic is an adjective it is sound effect time which says that that word is done we're finished we're never going back to that word here comes another word i'm going to i'm going to go flip it a flu Next is ectopic, E-C-T-O-P-I-C, adjective from 1873, occurring in an abnormal, uh, words are hard, occurring in an abnormal position or in an unusual manner or form, as in ectopic lesions. So these are lesions, some, some sort of maybe skin issue, that's in a weird position or an odd form. Ectopic. Uh, ectopically is an adverb. So I don't know if we're we're actually using the ecto prefix here, but the etymology says this is from the Greek ectopos or ectopos, which means out of place. Out of place, which is ex, pl- um, the prefix ex, which means out, plus topos, which means place. So, yep, out, place, out of place, not in the right place, not the right thing at all. Um, the only connection I'm seeing to the prefix is really just the, the prefix out. Ect, ect, uh, x is out. Um, let's see, was there anything else for that one? No, but we have a very, very related word next. Flu, 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 flu. Ectopic pregnancy and i think this is where most people are aware of the ectopic word Uh, this is a noun from 1895 a development of a fertilized egg elsewhere than in the uterus and examples of that would be in the fallopian tube or the peritoneal cavity peritoneal maybe that's how you say it peritoneal cavity I am not familiar with that cavity, but I am familiar with the fallopian tube. That is the tube that the egg travels down when it leaves the ovary, uh, getting ready for a uh, potential pregnancy or just the, the monthly, uh, monthly period, monthly menses. Uh, and so it goes down the fallopian tube, and sometimes it can either get stuck there, and then when the sperm comes in and it fertilizes the egg, it's stuck in the fallopian tube. That is not good, because the fallopian tube is not built for an egg 
a fertilized uh, egg to grow into a thing. It's not built for that. It's the uterus, not the fallopian tube. So that is a very, very bad pregnancy, and uh, that's that's when the doctor's got to go in and, and work on some stuff. I don't know if they terminate it or if they're able to move it into the uterus. I don't know if that's even possible. Um, but uh, yeah, ectopic pregnancy, and it's of course ectopic because it is occurring in an abnormal position than when where it's supposed to be. Don't want one of those. And I don't think there's anything that you can do to prevent it. Flip, 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 flip. Ectoplasm, or just ectoplasm, is next. And of course, how can you not think of the Ghostbusters when you think of ectoplasm? And then there was that high-C drink, ecto-cooler, which I think has come back now. It's just a, a bright green, sugary sweet drink. Oh, ectoplasm, what is it? Noun from 1883, one, the outer relatively rigid granule-free layer of the cytoplasm, usually held to be a gel, reversibly convertible to a soul. And gel is G-E-L, and soul is S-O-L. I vaguely remember reading those words in some other definition a while ago. I think a soul is essentially a solid. A gel would be probably like some not-quite-solid, not-quite-liquid thing ectoplasm. I mean, I definitely think of plasm as like a weird substance. What this is exactly describing, I am not entirely sure. Something about the cytoplasm with cells, probably? Outer relatively rigid granule-free layer of the cytoplasm. Yeah, the outer layer of a thing. And of course, ecto is the outside. It's the plasm layer on the outside. Two, a substance held to produce, here we go, spirit materialization and telekinesis. There are so many stories of old-timey people doing seances, and they're like, oh my god, look at this ectoplasm that has come out of my mouth. This is the spirit showing itself in physical form. But it was it was not. It just wasn't. It was, they they would take like, I don't know, cheesecloth, cotton, various fabrics, and I, I don't even know what they did. I, I got to put a link in the show notes for this stuff, I think. They would do some crazy, crazy stuff just to convince people that this is this, these are the spirits materializing in the real world, and it totally wasn't. Telekinesis. I want to do telekinesis. I don't know. Some people think it's possible. If it, if it is, I would, I would like to be able to do that, please and thank you. I'm practicing. Ectoplasmic. Ectoplasmic. That is an adjective. Flip, 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 flip. Ectotherm. E-C-T-O-T-H-E-R-M. Noun from 1940. Uh, this is a cold-blooded animal is an ectotherm. The synonym is poikilotherm, poikilotherm, P-O-I-K-I-L-O-T-H-E-R-M. Ectothermic is an adjective. So a cold-blooded animal, like what are we talking about, lizards and snakes? Are they ectotherms? So the reason, uh, th- there is no etymology, but I can tell you, uh, the, we've got the ecto prefix, which means outside, and then therm is like uh, the temperature. What is the temperature of the thing? Where does it get its uh, its temperature? How does it get to be? Um, uh, well, it, so I'm not describing that word well because I don't know the exact definition. But basically, cold-blooded animals require they need the heat from the sun or some other very warm light source. Uh, to give them heat. Otherwise, they're going to cool down. That's why you see a lot of them in the desert and stuff where there's a lot of heat and sun. And so, in this case, the thermal, the thermal part of the animal, the heat, is coming from an outside source. That's why we got the word ectotherm. I wonder, would, would warm-blooded animals like us mammals and humans, would we be called endotherms? That, that might be the case. 
I feel like that's got to be. But what is this word, poikilotherm? I, I can't wait to learn about that. Flip, 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 flip. Ectotrophic is next. Adjective from circa 1889. This one is talking about a word that I don't know. What is this? A mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza. M-Y-C-O-R-R-H-I-Z-A. I'm just going to say that that's pronounced mycorrhiza. So an uh, ectotrophic in relation to a mycorrhiza is growing in a close web on the surface of the associated root. And it says to compare to, aha, endotrophic. Now, ectotherm did not say compare to endotherm, but this word ectotrophic does say compare to endotrophic. So that would probably be uh, something not on the surface of the root, but maybe on the inside of the root. So maybe mycorrhiza is some sort of root thing. Um, Almost sounds like a fungus, maybe. I don't know. Um, But yeah, ectotrophic close something on the wet on the outside on the surface of a root flu 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 that was the end of the ect section here is the ecu section uh which is going to go through through this episode okay this word is pronounced either aq or and i don't know if i'm going to pronounce this right aq the, the pronunciation has the U-E uh, connected, so that seems like a French way to say it, and neither syllable is emphasized. A-Q. I'm just going to say A-Q, because that's my American way to say it. A-Q. It is just spelled E-C-U. This is the first form noun from circa 1593. Any of various old French units of value... Also, a coin representing an AQ. So the coin is AQ and the unit of value, uh, you know, we could say like the dollar is a unit of value in this context. In old Frenchy times, uh, they, I guess, had the AQ. Uh, So yes, of course, this is uh, French. Middle French literally means shield. So maybe the coin looked like a shield. Maybe I can find a picture, put it on the social media um, of, of one of these old French coins. Um, let's see, anything else? Uh, That's from the Latin scutum, which means uh, that is from the device of a shield on the coin. From the device of a shield on the coin. Not entirely sure what that means, but I guess maybe there was a a picture of a shield on the coin. Maybe the coin itself didn't look like a shield. They just probably stamped a shield. We like shields in our during the 1500s. There is more at the word Esquire. Huh, that's interesting. Hmm, Esquire. The first thing I think of Esquire is, uh, you know, Bill and Ted, they, they would say well, I have something Esquire... Uh, I think a, an, an Esquire is a, a lawyer, right? Is that, I think I've seen that connected to lawyers, attorneys. Um, but uh, yeah, clearly there's an etymog- etymological connection to uh, to shield and coins and stuff. Flu, 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 flu. The second form of AQ is not pronounced AQ at all. It is literally pronounced E-C-U. This is a noun and it is often capitalized. I don't know why you wouldn't have capitalized it here. All the letters would be capitalized. Uh, Noun from 1970, a money of account based on the currency units of members of the European Union from 1979 up to the introduction of the euro in 1999. So 20 years. Okay, so wait, let's just check this. So it's interesting... Well, this is an abbreviation for European Currency Unit. And, oh, fascinating. I was just about to mention this. So it is actually influenced by the French AQ. So were they like, hey, 
the French coin AQ is three letters, and we can easily make an acronym out of that. We can backronym it, European Currency Unit. And so I guess it says the money of account based on the currency units of members of the European Union. So I had never even heard of this, but it seems like it's a predecessor to the euro. So were there European countries in the European Union for 20 years using this AQ money? I feel like I would have learned about this, right? I don't know. I don't know what it is. I'll put a link in the show notes for this ECU, also AQ. It, it's uh, fascinating that they were li- that they literally used the French money to create this other thing. Interesting. Fla, 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 flu, flu. What is this sound? I don't know. The next word is equa, capital E C U A. It is an abbreviation for Ecuador, which, uh, huh? Yeah, I guess guess countries aren't in here. There is no... Why would you put the abbreviation for a country in here? That seems odd. When you're not going to put the country in here. Anyway. Fla, 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 fla. This is a kind of a weird word to say. Ecumenical or ecumenical. Um, I don't know. Between the, ec, the Q sound and the men... I think it's very easy, for at least for my brain, to switch those around. Ekian, you, I want to say ecumenical, but it's ecumenical. Adjective from circa 1587. One, worldwide or general in extent, influence, or application. So, I, I would like some context, uh, but basically the usage of a thing, the application of a thing can be either worldwide or very general in its usage. And so you can call that thing ecumenical. Uh, this podcast is ecumenical in the sense that uh, it, it's all the stuff. It's Everybody on the world can appreciate me talking about these things because it's all the stuff. But the only problem is that it's in English and not everybody speaks English. 2A of relating to or representing the whole of a body of churches. And that is whole, W-H-O-L-E. So all of the things, the churchy things, the bodies of the churches, that is ecumenical. To be promoting or tending toward worldwide Christian unity or cooperation. So clearly this this word is uh, often related to Christianity ecumenically, that is an adverb. So the word is from, we're going down to Greek, oikurmeni, which means the inhabited world. That's just, that's all, that's the whole thing, the inhabited world. Uh, That is from the feminine oikumenos, which is the present past participle of oikin, which means to inhabit. That's, uh, I guess, the verb oikin, to inhabit, which is from oikos, which means house. And there's more at the word vicinity for some reason. Um, so, yeah, it's all about just inhabiting a thing. This stuff inhabits the churches and the world, and it's ecumenical. Fru, 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 fru. Next is ecumenicalism. Ecumenicalism. That is a long word. Noun from 1888. The synonym is ecumenism, which is, yes, that's coming up in this episode. Ecumenism. Ecumenism. Hey, we got more similar words. Oh, uh, oh, and also I got to say here, ecumenicist is a noun. They are probably one who studies ecumenism or ecumenicism ecumenicism yeah flu, 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 flu. ecumenicity is next e c u m e n i c i t y ecumenicity noun from 1840 the quality or state of being drawn close to others through ecumenism the state of being drawn close to others through ecumenism is ecumenicity. Come on, everybody. Let's come close. Let's draw close to each other. I don't know. Is this physically drawing close? Is this 
emotionally? Is it through the internet? Is it bringing us closer together? I don't know. Ecumenics is next. Noun from circa 1945. The study of the nature, mission, problems, and strategy of the Christian church from the perspective of its ecumenical character. I don't know, something about the Christian churchy things. Here is not the last word. It is the last ECU word, and we've already talked about it a little bit. Flu, 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 flu. Ecu, yes, ecumenism. Ecu, you could you could pronounce it a few ways. Ecumenism, ecumenism. Noun from 1948. This is ecumenical principles and practices, especially as shown among religious groups, like Christian denominations. Various denom- denominations in the Christian faith, uh, they, they've got ecumenical principles and practices, and all of that is called ecumenism. Ecumenist. Ecumenist. That's how you say that. Ecumen, no, ecumenist or ecumenist, or ecumenist, that is a noun. Yeah, don't totally understand this. Uh, Maybe I'll put a link in the show notes for ecumenism if you want to learn more about that. Okay, one more word. This is the the first ECZ word, the first and last. It's also the last EC word. So we're getting into the ED section starting in the next episode. The last word is eczema, E-C-Z-E-M-A. You can pronounce it eczema, eczema, or eczema, however you want to say it. If you even want to say eczema, that's fine too. Noun from circa 1753, an inflammatory condition of the skin characterized by redness itching, and oozing vesicular lesions which become scaly, crusted, or hardened. Eczematous, that is an adjective. And I will put a link in the show notes for eczema. Um, I'm not sure if I want to put any pictures on social media because I think some some people might be a little bit grossed out. Not that I think you should be grossed out. I'm just saying certain people are grossed out by things like that. So I won't I won't post that. I, I'm totally fine posting like creepy crawly creatures and not giving any warning about that. Uh, but if you want to see what eczema looks like, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's it's not it's not bad. I mean, it's it's a very irritating thing and it can definitely affect people's lives and mental health for sure. Um but it's it's just a, it's just kind of a weird dry scaly skin thing, and uh, you know there's various levels of light eczema and really bad all over the skin. Uh, but if you want to see what it looks like, go ahead and and Google it. Uh, the etymology this is from the Greek eczema, from exine, which means to erupt. So I guess this is like a uh, something erupting from the skin. Uh, from the prefix X, which means out, plus zine, Z-E-I-N, which means to boil. So you put those together, boiling out, coming out of the skin, erupting out. Uh, and there is more at the prefix X and also the word yeast. So maybe, uh, you know, our bodies do create some yeast. So maybe there's some yeast in this eczema stuff. I don't know. Never never heard about that or thought about that, but that's interesting. Maybe you can break, make some bread from your eczema. That's probably not a good idea. I, I don't think you should do that. Okay, so it is time to reread the words real fast-like and pick a word of the episode. Ectoparasite, ectopic, ectopic pregnancy, ectoplasm, ectotherm, ectotrophic, AQ, ECU, equa, ecumenical, ecumenicalism, ecumenical. Oh my God, I skipped one. <laughs> this is not the first time that this has happened. Might be the second, second or third. Hey, let's talk about this word, ecumenical patriarch. 
Two words, noun, often capitalized, the E and the P. It's from 1862. It is the patriarch of Constantinople, not Istanbul, as the dignitary given first honor in the Eastern Orthodox Church. I got nothing else to say about that. Let's finish reading our words. We have ecumenicism. Um, ecumenicism. Now, wait a minute. Did I skip two words? I think I think I got confused because here's the thing. This is what's going on here. Uh, there are two words that have the synonym ecumenism. This the synonym ecumenism. Uh, and so I think what I happened what I, what I happened to do was I when I looked away briefly as I was talking about something I looked back and I think I skipped down to ecumenicism which also has the synonym ecumenism so let's backtrack real quick just to just to straighten this all out we've got ecumenicalism that is the noun from 1888 with the synonym ecumenism yeah, I think what happened was I looked to, to the pronunciation, and then when I came back, I got all messed up. Then we have ecumenical patriarch. Then we have ecumenicism, which is also which is a noun from 1961 with also the synonym ecumenism. That's where we see ecumenicist. That's the noun. And then, and then we get to the rest of the words ecumenicity, ecumenics. Ecumenism, or ecumenism, and then we have eczema. Oh boy, I am sorry about that. No way am I re-recording and editing all that to be proper. Nope, nope, you get to see all of my fuck-ups. Okay, so what am I going to pick as the word of the episode? I think I just want to pick ectoplasm, because, you know, that's just a cool stuff ectoplasm is really cool i think there should be a song called ectoplasm ectoplasm coming out of my mouth is it fabric or is it real ectoplasm from a ghost ectoplasm it seemed like it needed to be a hard rock kind of thing hey thanks for listening i very much appreciate you coming to join me on this journey Let's talk about another movie uh, that I saw. Uh, by the way, I need to mention, in the previous episode, I mentioned that I uh, that we watched Insidious and that I had not seen the fourth or fifth movies yet. Um, I actually have seen the fourth movie. I forgot that I did watch it. I'll get to that one in, I don't know, 10 episodes from now. Uh, but the next movie we saw actually was Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Or no, is it... What is it? What's the actual title? Let's let's look up the actual title. Uh, but you know what movie I'm talking about. Uh, I had not seen this for a, quite a while. Uh, when I was in film school, uh, my, my Film Tech 1 teacher uh, showed us the beginning to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Of course, I'm sure all of us had already seen it. But the, his point was, um, it's... It's its its own story. The That first, whatever, 10, 15 minutes if it's even that long, uh, is just a really well-made short story. And uh, now I, I'm curious about your opinion on this. Is it fair to say that uh, Indiana Jones and also his his sort of fellow nemesis archaeologist who shows up at the end of that scene, um, is he the villain of this situation? It, it To me, it feels like he is. He's going in to this cave that is set up with booby traps. They don't want people to come in. And he's stealing this thing just so they can study it and put it in a museum. That feels like not the thing that Indiana Jones is normally does or should be doing. It feels like he's go he's I th- I thought he would be more respectful of the native people and their stuff. Uh, but I guess not. Uh, but it's a super fun adventure movie. Uh, amazing action. Uh, amazing shots. There's a, Actually, I'll put in the, a link in the show notes. There's somebody who... I think it was Raider... No, maybe it was Temple of Doom. Uh, maybe I'll save that for that one. Somebody made a video about you know watching it in black and white. and uh, I can't remember if it was Raiders or Temple. I'll check. I'll check. Um, but yeah, great movie. Super fun. 
I, you know, it's probably the best of the series. Uh, so, so many great things. You know, the melting face. Oh, my God. I loved it as a kid. Super weird and creepy. And uh, anyway, go go watch it. You know, I got I got issues. You know, he's a he's a Bond character. I don't know. Whatever. We're not going to get into all that. It's just fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for listening. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. What's going on with you, word nerds? Hello, everybody. My name is Spencer. I am here with another episode of The Dictionary, where I am reading you the dictionary. Yes, I am. It is 7.02 a.m. July 13th. It's a Thursday. 13th a Thursday. It's Thursday the 13th. Uh, I'm in my work office, and I am now going to read the beginning of the ED section for you today. Is everybody excited? That's fantastic. All right, the first word is ED, E-D, all lowercase, first form, noun from 1954. The synonym is education, as in driver's ed, also as in Adult ed. We have to shorten it. We cannot say the whole phrase. We can't say driver's education. Driver's ed. I don't know. It's just easier. Why do we do it? We we don't know. Sex ed. That's another one. What other eds are there? Education. Geology ed. I don't think that's what people say. Hey, let's go on to the next one. Uh, the sound effect will be... Cha-cha-cha. Now we have the second form of ed, but this one, this one is an abbreviation which means edited, edition, or editor. Edited edition editor. The editor edited the edition. Cha-cha-cha-cha. Next is ED again, but this is all caps. Every single letter in that word is capitalized. It is also an abbreviation, but instead of uh, just a word getting shortened down, we're using the first letters uh, for erectile dysfunction. You probably have seen many commercials about fix your ED, take this medicine. They don't call it a medicine. Take this pill, take this thing. It's going to cure your erectile dysfunction. And, uh, you know, I assume that that's going to be in this book some when we get to the ER section. It's probably going to be there, although I really don't know. But ED, that's that's an important enough thing that we got to put that in here. Cha-cha-cha. Okay, this next word, we got a couple forms. It is the ED suffix. And, you know, if you, if you know your English language, ED gets put on to the end of a whole lot of words. And we got a number... Of definitions here and we're starting off with the, the pronunciation guide what what is going on here so the pronunciation just says that I think it's just sounds like duh it's literally just shows a D duh but it's after a vowel that I think it's pronounced duh or ud after a vowel or B G J L M N N R, th, v, z, or z. <laughs> so, after all of those consonant sounds or a vowel, you pronounce it d. <laughs> um, or it's pronounced ud or id after d or t. Or it could be t, t, after other sounds. And it says exceptions are pronounced at their entries. Uh, wow, yeah, that was a lot of complicated information. I'm sure that we could uh, break it down more, but we will see some examples in these definitions. So we'll, I guess, we'll talk about the pronunciation when we get to those, probably. Yeah, okay. So this says it is a verb suffix or an adjective suffix, and there is no year. So, in number one, it says it is used to form the past participle of regular weak verbs, as in ended, faded, tried, and patted. 
petted. So let's see. N did. Uh, it's N ed end ed. And uh, so I guess if we're looking at the pronunciation guide, it would be pronounced id after D or T. So N did end id. Also fade id and tried. Now this one is weird because this is after a vowel T R I E D. Tried duh. You just say duh. And then patted. And that's the uh, the id pronunciation. Pat id. Number two, it is uh, used to form adjectives of identical meaning from Latin derived adjectives ending in a t e, as in crenulated. Crenulate, and then we add the d, really the e d, but the eight already had an e at, at the end of it. Crenulated, so forming, we're forming an adjective from this Latin derived adjective. Crenulate, crenulated. Oh, that thing is so crenulated. 3A. It means either having or characterized by, as in cultured or two legged. Two legged. Uh, so you are, you have two legs, so you are two legged, or you are characterized by your culture, so you are cultured. And so let's look at the pronunciation cultured. We just say d because it's after an r. And we saw in the pronunciation, you just say d after an r. And then two-legged. Now this one, though, two, or no, see, that's the thing. You could say it a couple ways. You could say two-legged. And because it's after a g, you just say d, two-legged. But a lot of people say two-legged, like I did. So, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a wishy-washy area. And then 3b is having the characteristics of, and the example here is bigoted. Ends in a t. Bigot, you have the characteristics of being a bigot, so you are bigoted. Uh, let's see. So I'm, I'm thinking, so we have a second form. Um, I never really thought about how this suffix is used. You just use it a whole lot of ways, and we just got four four different uses, uh, but now we got more. But let's look at the etymology. It is from the Old English ed or odd or ad, which is akin to the Old High German t. These are all suffixes. Uh, that is the, what is that? P -p -p something ending, which is from the Latin suffix tus, which is from the Greek suffix tos, which is a suffix forming verbals. And boy, I wish I was a smarter... English person to give you better information. But that's not what we're here for. We're just here for the definitions, really. Cha -cha 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 -cha. Okay, here is the second form of the ed suffix. This one is specifically a verb suffix. Um, there is just one usage information. It just says it is used to form the past tense of regular weak verbs. And let's go back to the first definition for the previous one, that says used to form the past participle of regular weak verbs. And they're very similar. Um, the first one is the past participle of reek, <laughs> reek, regular weak verbs. And the second one is used to form the past tense of regular weak verbs. I don't know what the difference is. I apologize. Uh, it's some sort of way the words are used, I guess. Uh, so, here in this second form of ed, um, it doesn't give any pronunciation, by the way, so I think it's all the same. Um, it's the past past form. You put it at the end, you want to make the past tense of a regular weak verb, as in the examples, judged, denied, and dropped. The judge dropped the charges because they were denied, and then the person was not judged. The etymology says, ah, so it is a little different than the previous one. Um, instead of from the Old English ed or odd or ad, it is from the Old English de or ede or ode or ada. And I don't know how to pronounce those, so I'm going to spell them for you. These are all suffixes. D-E, E-D-E, O-D-E, or A-D-E. Interesting similar but different than the previous one. Uh, it is akin to the Old High German suffix ta, 
and the previous form of ed had the old high German suffix just t. And uh, let's see, probably also from the old high German suffix t, which it mean, just means ending or something like that. So uh, clearly there's some connection between these two forms of ed, but they're, you know, used in different ways or sometimes similar ways, but not exactly the same ways. But regular weak verbs have got to be in there somewhere. Uh, okay, it's a very useful suffix. How would we know when something is in the past form without the suffix ed or de? Cha cha cha. Next is edacious. E D A C I O U S. All the five vowels are in there. Edacious. Adjective from circa 1798. Number one is archaic, and it means of or relating to eating. Oh, I wish we still used this. Why don't we use this anymore? But we have a similar. There's, uh, the next one is similar. Number two, the synonym is voracious. So if you are eating a whole lot of food, you are being very voracious with your dinner. You are voraciously eating. Audacity is a noun. So the etymology is related to eating because, you know, that archaic form was all about eating, and uh, that's where the word comes from. It's from the Latin verb adere, which means to eat. And there's more at the word eat. Why don't we use this for eating anymore? Audacious. So it's like uh, just relating, relating to eating. Um, how do you use that in a sentence? Um, I was, could you say I was audaciously, audaciously eating? Audacious. That food is audacious. I'm about to eat it. I don't know. Uh, but we should bring it back. Next is Edam or Edom. Capital E, D A M, noun from 1836. A yellow pressed cheese of Dutch origin, used usually made in flattened balls and often coated with red wax. Uh, when I was a kid, we, we had, I mean, we still have these, what is it, Baby Bell or other brands. Uh, it's just a, a flattened round ball of cheese in this red wax. And of course, it was fun to take off the wax and then make a ball out of that or maybe sculpt it, sculpt it into something. Um, these are quite, quite popular, but it's from the 1830s. The 1830s, so, so many years ago. Uh, this is from Edam or Edom, Netherlands. I don't know how they pronounce that city or town or village or area. Uh, but I guess that's where they made it. It's a yellow pressed cheese. My wife and I were taking a walk recently, and we actually saw a bag of these. You know, there's like it's wrapped in a, like a foil or something, but the wax is on the inside, and then the cheese is on the inside of that. It's just a whole bag of them sitting on a fence... And it had recently rained and I think was had also been very hot. And we we're like, hmm, there's some there's some summer sun cheese hanging out on a fence. I want to eat that wonderful sun rain cheese. Uh, let's see. Anything else about Edam? I feel like I've heard it in some sort of context. I don't remember if it was Wallace and Gromit or... Oh, no, it was probably uh, Monty Python. I think that they... They mentioned Edam cheese maybe somewhere, possibly. I can't remember. Ch -ch 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 -ch. Next is edamame. Edamame. Noun from 1951. Immature green soybeans, usually in the pod. I think many of us enjoy some edamame. Gotta, gotta shake a little salt on there. Maybe it goes cha-cha-cha-cha. That's the sound of the salt shaker. Uh, we just got some of these not that long ago. There's a there's an Asian place near us that we like to go to, and uh, we got some edamame. And you know you gotta have a it, there's a bowl of the edamame, and then you gotta have a plate or a bowl to put your to put your pods. But here's the question: What sort of person are you like? Do you eat the entire thing, or do you just 
shove the beans out of the pod with your teeth and cheeks and lips. How do you use your cheeks? And then you eat the beans inside the pod, but then you got to put the pod out. What do you do? I, I don't eat the pod, but I feel like I've heard some people eat the pod. What kind of crazy people are these? I'm kidding. You're not crazy. But I'm curious. What do you do? What, what do you do? How do you eat edamame? How do you... I don't know how to use audacious in this context. How, do you, how is your edamame audaciousness? This is a Japanese word. It is from eda. I don't know how they pronounce it. E-D-A, which means branch. And mame, which means beans. So beans from a branch, it's a very obvious word when you think about it that way. Edamame. I never thought about the etymology, and now I'm glad I know what it means. And of course, the next time I eat edamame with some people, I'm going to say, hey, did you know, did you know that this word basically means branch bean? It does. And now let's eat these branch beans. cha Next is edaphic, E-D-A-P-H-I-C, edaphic, adjective from circa 1900, one, of or relating to the soil, the stuff that you might be standing on right this very minute, just relating to the soil is edaphic. Two, resulting from or influenced by the soil rather than the climate. So you, what in this context, you're talking about uh, something, oh, it's a daffic because, well, this food was grown more so because of the soil rather than the climate that the thing is in. I don't know. I'm just making up examples because I don't know how the people use it. Uh, resulting from or influenced, yeah, it's being influenced because more of the soil. It's the soil's thing. It's from the soil and not so much because of the the temperature and the the rain and that's the things that can be related to climate um it says to compare to the second form of the word climatic climatic yeah we talked about that before um i do feel like i need to do a quick little check back because we got another thing that is related so i want to maybe give you a little bit more context if i can Let's see if we can find this word real quick. Ooh, I just messed up the corners of these pages real bad. <laughs> uh, let's see. Here we are getting close to cli... What is this word? Climatic. Climatic. Uh, okay. Here is climatic. Uh, that's So that's relating to the climate. So that would be more about the... Yes, literally, resulting from or influenced by the climate rather than the soil. And it says to compare to a daphic number two. Okay, so now we know that those are opposites. Can you say they're opposites? Uh, adaphically is an adverb. This is from the Greek adaphos, which means bottom or ground. It's from down there. So the next word that's related is a daphic climax noun from 1926 an ecological climax resulting from soil factors and commonly persisting through cycles of climatic and physiographic change and it says compare to climatic climax which is kind of a weird weird two words to put together climatic climax so that one says the one of the ecological climaxes possible in a particular climatic area whose stability is directly due to the influence of climax, climate. Oh my God, I'm confusing the words. So, yeah, so that's, you. It's, 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 we're talking about the soil versus the climate. And I still don't really remember what a climax is in this context. There's too many of these uh, definitions to read through. Something about... I don't know, geology, dirt, uh, the other things. Next is EDB, all caps. It is an abbreviation for ethylene dibromide. I think you, I think you emphasize the first word, first syllable there, dibromide. Ethylene dibromide. 
and I'm assuming that we will see that in the ETH section. EDD is next. Now, this one is um, the middle letter. The first D is lowercase, and the others are capitalized uh, because this is abbreviation for Doctor of Education. So it looks like the first two letters are the ed, the education, and then the last letter, the capital D, is doctor. So it's backwards. It probably stands for education doctor or something like that. Doctor of education. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do surgery on this textbook. EDD again. This one is all caps. Abbreviation for English Dialect Dictionary. And I am fascinated by what is in that dictionary. Just, just talks about what? The different dialects? Or is it giving literal like words and all the words that are in the different di- like the In this area, you use the word Coke to talk about a soda pop. In this word, you use, in this, this word, in this area, you use pop. In this area, you use soda. In this area, some people just say orange. Interesting dictionary. I, I, uh, if you got one of these, if you study it, let me know. I'm curious to know what it's all about. Edic is next. Capital E D D I C. Edic. Adjective from 1868. Of relating to or resembling the Old Norse Edda. What's what or who is the Old Norse Edda, spelled E-D-D-A, with a capital E? Well, the etymology says, very literally, this is from the Old Norse word Edda, which is, or was, a 13th century collection of mythological, heroic, and aphoristic poetry. So this is poetry that was mythological, talked about the myths, maybe some unicorns and pegasuses and other things. Also heroic, like maybe Odysseus would have been heroic, the Odyssey. Uh, And aphoristic, I don't remember what that word means. I should know it, I don't. Uh, So yeah, anything related to all that stuff is edic. Next is eddy, E-D-D-Y. First form, noun from the 15th century. 1A, a current of water or air running contrary to the main current, especially a circular current. And the synonym is whirlpool. So if you got a river and it's just going in one direction from left to right, let's just say that way, there could be a current of water that's just different. It's just not with the rest of the current. I guess technically it could go uh, perpendicular to the rest of it, or it could go right to left, which is backwards. But yes, I think more often than not, it is a whirlpool. It's going to go spinning, spinning in into a vortex of nothingness. Uh, try not to get sucked into the eddy. That's probably the most common. Uh, but I guess if it's a you know a bigger body of water, there could be it could be going another direction. Um, and yes, our air, our air is liquid. So um, just uh, just last night, uh, we had a tornado warning. Luckily in my area, we got nothing, but I'm guessing other parts of Chicago got pretty messed up, and I hope everybody is okay. Uh, but uh, I you could you call a a tornado or a hurricane an eddy? Or maybe it starts from an eddy. How do these things begin? Um, Yeah, it would be a whirlpool in the sky. A whirl... It's it's not a pool. A whirl funnel. I don't know. 1B for eddy. Something moving similarly. So if it's just moving in maybe a whirlpool way, if you're just standing there spinning, trying to make yourself dizzy, uh, you could be called an eddy. And maybe your name is Eddie. Two, a contrary or circular current as of thought or policy. Ooh, we can have a mental Eddie. Contrary to what else you're thinking about 
or going circularly, if you've got some thoughts that send you to one direction and to another thing and then to another thing and then back to the first thing, you're just going around in a circle and you have a, a tornado, hercure, hurricane, whirlpool, eddy of thoughts. I hope that makes sense. Uh, this is from Middle English, but then in parentheses it says SC, which I think is Scandinavian. So maybe it's like a Scandinavian Middle English or something. Their word is Y-D-Y. So did they pronounce it Eddie? Edie? Widwi? I don't know. Probably also from the Old Norse word Itha. I-T-H-A. Second form of Eddie. This one is a verb. So you also got Eddied and Eddying. This is a verb. Yes, we said that from 1810, starting with transitive. To cause to move in an eddy. How can you can you make something move in in, in into an eddy? Um, maybe if you put your finger in the river and you just spin it around a lot, maybe you can create an eddy, create a whirlpool. I'm gonna eddy the river. River, you are now called eddy. Now, intransitive says to to move in an eddy or in the manner of an eddy. So you are the one who has been eddied. Maybe you're making yourself move into an eddy. You're just spinning. You're eddying yourself, making an eddy. Similar, we got eddy current. Two words, noun from 1886. This is uh, many, many years after the other forms of eddy. This one is an electric current induced by an alternating magnetic field. And I think I want to put a link in the show notes for this one because uh, that's that's interesting. It's an electric current induced by an alternating magnetic field. I don't know what any of that means. How do you do that? Who invented this? It, it, maybe they didn't invent it. But is it, why is it eddy current? Is it uh, because it's going contrary to the other currents is it going around in a circle is it i don't know i don't know that's why we got to put a link in the show notes so you can learn all about it last word edelweiss or edelweiss e-d-e-l w-e-i-s-s yes you could say vice or weiss Noun from 1862, a small alpine perennial composite herb of Central and Southeast Europe that has a dense, woolly, white pubescence. And I will post a picture of this Edelweiss on social media, uh, uh, Instagram at DictionaryPod, Twitter is also at DictionaryPod, and there probably will be threads at DictionaryPod. I just have to make the account, which I might do today. I don't know. We'll see. There is a picture, though. I will try to describe it, but, you know, if you don't know your plants like I don't, then it's hard to describe. Let's see. It's got some leaves. They're very long and slender. And it's got some petals, which look like they are light-colored because it does say... uh, Where does it say? Does it say it's white? Uh, Small alpine perennial composite herb of central and south. No, it doesn't say... White pubescence. I guess that would be it. Uh, So the, the leaves are also... Long and slender. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, like twelve, thirteen ish. And then it looks like the middle, uh, you know, the little things that poke out. What are those? The stamens? I don't remember. They, uh, there's, I don't know. I can't really describe them. They have like, they're like, they look like white little balls with black spots in the middle. Can't really tell. Super tiny. Check social media. The species name is. Leon, eh? Leontopodium, Leontopodium alpinum, or alpinum. This is Greek, no, German, sorry, I saw the G. It's German from their word edel, E-D-E-L, which means noble, plus weiss, which means white. So it is a very noble white plant, an herb specifically. Isn't there that song in, uh, was it the Sound of Music? 
Edelweiss, Edelweiss. I might have that wrong. I feel like it's in a song, though. Okay. 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 Let's finish up this episode by quickly rereading the words and picking a word of the episode and then trying to sing some sort of song off the top of my head, and then I'll talk about another movie I watched. We had Ed, Ed, E-D, Id, Ed, Edacious, Edam, Edamame, Adaphic, Adaphic Climax, E-D-B, E-D-D, E-D-D, Edic, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Current, and Edelweiss. I think I want to pick Edacious as the word of the episode because... Well, it means voracious, which is also a fun word, but also it's just about eating, and we don't use it in that context anymore, and that bothers me. I'm so sad that we don't use the word audacious to talk about eating anymore. It makes me very sad. I want more words to talk about eating, but I don't know how to use them in context. That was fine. That was fine, just fine. What is another movie that we watched? Insidious 2. Uh, This was, again, uh, a second watch, uh, just getting ready for the fifth movie, which still haven't seen at the moment. Um, I'm trying to remember which one this is. Uh, The third one, I think, is in the apartment. The second one... Oh, boy. Why can't I remember which one this is? My brain is so fried of all these movies. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's just you know some fun, creepy stuff with uh, with uh, going into the whole thing is like they're going into the 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 further you sort of like go into a meditative state and then you can go into this like weird ethereal world uh, where where the dead people are or the demons and you can go there but you can't stay there too long because you're not dead so you got to go back and you know it's just good creepy stuff. All right, that is the end of this episode. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye.